focus on cloud, location, data center, industry, trends, the dynamic market. Uh, I'm David Liggett with Data Center Hawk, and uh, I'm really excited to be sitting with Tag Greeson. Tag is the Chief Hyperscale Officer at QTS. Uh, so, Tag, thanks for hosting us. David, thanks for coming. Yeah, really excited it. to be here. We're yep. sitting actually in uh, your Dallas, the first Dallas data center that you have, uh, which is massive. And I actually remember walking through this like right when you purchased it. And so to see what you all have done here and, and what you're doing next door and in Fort Worth, it's really uh, impressive. So. Yeah, thank you. Well, we're happy to have you here, and yeah. I'm glad you came back to see the finished <laughs> product. Sure. Um, I remember my first visit here when we first acquired and we're going through the due diligence yeah. process. Um, it was a daunting, oh, big, huge, yeah. massive building, yes. and to see where it is now is, is really fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, before we, we start on this, kind of walk uh, the, the people that are watching through uh, just your role at QTS and uh, and then what you were doing before to get to that spot today. Yeah, it's an interesting role. It's, uh, I think, the first in the industry title <laughs> of Chief Hyperscale, Hyperscale Officer. Yeah. Uh, it's made up, uh, okay. to be honest with you. Sure. I think most people would think of it as kind of a Chief Commercial Officer. Uh -huh. uh, I partner with a guy named Clint Hyden, who mm -hmm. runs the other half of our business, which is our hybrid colo business. Yeah. And together we manage all the go-to-market activities for the company. Hyperscale in our world is a list of 30 customers uh -huh. or prospects. Um, we think of them in two phases. One, do they buy at scale? Uh -huh. And do they buy with frequency? And if that's true, then largely they're a hyperscale sure. prospect or customer. Sure. Um, what we love about our business is we've been um, in the hyperscale business before hyperscale was cool. <laughs> I mean, we've had large customers yeah. here at QTS for um, coming on a decade. Uh -huh. Um, and I've been at the company for a little over eight years and yeah. have always been associated with those large, fast-moving accounts. Yeah, so one of the words you used was scale. And if you ask me, even when we started Data Center Hawk, you know, I don't know if I would have anticipated the amount of uh, uh, scalable requirements that were coming to the market from 2014 you know, to today. Why do you feel like that's become such a, uh, an important part of users' needs over the last several years. You know, it, when, when we talk about scale, in my perspective, you've got kind of real scale at like the 20, 30, 40 megawatt sure. scale. And there's really only four buyers in that market, mm -hmm. four or five, yep. give or take. Um, I think we all know who they are sure. and, uh, and they buy in, um, in that kind of scale. Right. But that decision point is one of, should they build their own building mm -hmm. or mm -hmm go to an operator yeah. like a QTS yep. or another competitor. And that's a really interesting dialogue about scale. Yep. The other part of the hyperscale market is two megawatts, three megawatts, sure. you know, every six, eight months, 12 months. And it's scale over time. Mm -hmm. And so if you manage that customer, you're going to end up with a 15, 16 megawatt customer. Sure. But it kind of is like boiling water. It happened one yeah. megawatt at a time. Yes. And so scale is interesting in the perspective that there's really two flavors in the market and mm -hmm. it's hard to be all things to everybody, yep. but if you have a good nimble delivery system, sure. you can actually do both. Yeah, and one of the ways that I think the bigger requirements have changed the market, it's really pushed the data center operator industry to really think about how are we building, how are yeah. we bringing these solutions to the market, how quickly can we do it, uh, talk about how the, the change in size and the desire to meet the needs of your customers has really changed the way you approach design and build and, and delivery. Yeah, we, you know, we think that the hyperscale market requires four things okay. at, the, at the baseline. Okay. And those four things are scale that we just sure. talked about, uh, speed to delivery, yep. economics, and location. Okay. And if you can meet those four requirements, I think you're in a discussion with a hyperscale company. Mm -hmm. Okay. Talking about scale and what their scale is driving into our industry yep. from a cost perspective, a delivery perspective. Yes. It's interesting that in five years ago, David, I would say innovation was about creating the new mousetrap that would do something better uh -huh. or the technology was so advanced that you could take advantage of it. Yep. Innovation today is how many components of this system can I take out sure. yeah. and still have yeah. the same reliability and the same performance yep. in, in a data center. And so it's that, it's the elegance of a simple design mm -hmm. which is coming from these hyperscalers. Yeah. They're, they're requiring you to be more elegant, more simple, to yep. remove cost components out, because they don't want to pay for them. Yeah. And that's that's really kind of the evolution of what that 
group has done to the industry. Yeah, and, it's, and I think watching the relationship between those companies and data center operators uh, and how they look to utilize the, the uh, ec economies of scale, um, the, the cost of capital, the, the, the things that, and the expertise of delivering the solutions that the third party providers bring to the market and how that's grown over the last several years has been fascinating. And it's grown in markets like Dallas, it's grown in markets like Chicago, it's grown in markets like Silicon Valley. But where it has really grown is where you're from, which yeah. is uh, Northern Virginia yeah. in Ashburn. Talk a little bit about uh, that market and just how you have per you know, personally seen um, it grow the way it has over the last several years. Yeah, you know, I've lived in Ashburn for 15 years. Uh -huh. um, QTS has not been there the entire time. Mm -hmm. um, we're excited to be there now. Um, you came and visited us sure. and, and our three-story uh, purpose-built data center, our office space. It's, it's a really great environment um, in Ashburn, but I'll tell you it's a very competitive environment. Okay. As, uh, as you and I were talking, sitting in my office in Ashburn, um, I can see on, on a given day between yeah. six and eight <laughs> cranes across yes. the horizon in building data centers at, at scale. Um, but Ashburn is such a unique environment from a data center perspective. Mm -hmm. I think you know, you know, we saw 270 megawatts of absorption mm -hmm. in 2018. Yeah. You know, we don't see that every year, and we probably won't see it in 2019 mm -hmm. if the first quarter is, yeah. any, is any indicator of that. Um, but it's such a, it's a place where uh, you have to be yeah, if you want to sure. be in the internet business, if you want to be in the hyperscale business. And building at scale is, is really the, um, the flavor of the month in, in Ashburn. Sure, uh, and, and one of the things that we've seen, I would say, change over time is how the industry looks at energy use and yeah. the, the value that companies themselves and data center operators are putting on renewable energy and how important it is to make sure that we're using resources effectively and wisely. Uh, I know that's a big initiative for QTS in the future. Why is that such an important thing for QTS to pursue yeah. uh, from a renewable energy perspective? You know, we talked about uh, in the earlier part of this talk, um, location, scale, economics and speed. Yes. I will tell you the next layer of decision criteria are, are you 100% renewable and if not, by when? Mm -hmm. well, when will you get there? What's mm -hmm. your corporate plan? And I'm proud that we just released our first ESG report. Okay. Uh, QTS you know, tries to lead the industry in a lot of different areas, but environmental, sustainability yes. and governance is so important in the decision criteria for these hyperscalers. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's not, uh, regulatory, it's mm -hmm. not law, it's yeah. they're trying to be good citizens and, and good stewards, and that flows right through to their supply chain. Sure. Right? So that ESG area is super important. Um, in doing that, we believe, yeah, we're being good stewards, but we also have better um, uh, economies, yeah. uh, better operational uh -huh. um, costs. Yeah. We, we actually can run a more efficient facility. And that's all part of this equation to make sure that the energy costs and the sustainability come together yeah. and are not at odds. Five years ago, someone would say, yeah, I want to be sustainable. All right, you're going to have to pay more. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what this is really going to end mm -hmm. up at, right? I want to be sustainable and I want a good operational sure. benefit. And that's where, that's where we are right now is those two things are coming together. Yeah. So one of the things I, I think that I've seen at least uh, as I think about QTS over the last you know, four to five years is, you know, this, it, it seems like the company was really run with a spirit of entrepreneurialism, that's a word, yeah. and, uh, and so watching as the company's grown and you're able to still use that trait to help solve and be creative in solving, you know, deals and things like that. Uh, you know, we've seen how in the past, you know, data center users traditionally had wanted turnkey data center product uh, delivered, you know, with them coming in and, and just leasing the space. Uh, now we're starting to see more build to suit opportunities. We're starting to see, I would say, maybe flexibility in the way you all are offering your solutions. How important yeah. is that as you're approaching solving the needs of so many users today in the market, just being flexible in the solutions that you offer? Yeah, so when, when you talk about all those criteria, and I, yeah. go, I always look at every question through the lens of the customer, sure. right? What, what are they trying to accomplish? Yeah. And that flexibility is very important in the marketplace. Um, I also love that QTS did grow up uh, with that entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. And I would say we were very opportunistic yep. in how we grew and how we expanded. Mm -hmm. About four years ago, we really started to be more intentional mm -hmm. about how we were going to grow and how we were going to meet the needs of the market. Yep. 
And so you take that yeah, entrepreneurial sweet. spirit and that, that uh, opportunistic um, uh, attitude yep. and you translate that into being more intentional without losing the underlying spirit of the sure. entrepreneur, yeah, right? You bet. And so when we talk to customers, we think, okay, what is the customer gonna need? Mm -hmm. And if you think about scale at 30 megawatts uh -huh. or two megawatts, 500 kW sure. or a cabinet, yep. what we do is we layer uh, infrastructure and then put on top of that things like service delivery platform. Mm -hmm. And we offer services and, and uh, APIs and, sure. and insight yeah. into the customers to manage their own environments on our world-class yep. infrastructure. Yep. It's that enablement that gives the customers more flexibility than just saying, here's turnkey, yep. good luck, yeah. but really being yep. more of a, of a um, not just a landlord, but yeah. actually a service provider. No, that makes sense. And yep. I think that's the greatest value that you all are working to provide is is how do we solve your challenges, you know, yep. more than just space power and cooling, but beyond that. So I know you sitting in the chief hyperscale officer seat, uh, the global part of our business is obviously something that you're well aware of. Uh, QTS, I guess it was in, just recently has announced, uh, you know, an expansion into, into Amsterdam. Yeah. Uh, but talk about the international um, approach to this business and how you see, you're seeing that change over time. Well, you know, if I look at it through the customer's lens, they're going to need to be uh, in an availability zone that can service their end users, yeah. right? And so, you know, uh, certain customers that, that we are partners with uh -huh. have figured out how to service the globe from the domestic United sure. States. And that's their business model, and that makes sense. It works for them, yeah. But a lot of them will say, no, 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 I want an availability zone in Amsterdam, in London, in Paris, um, in Frankfurt. Yeah. Um, I want to be in Asia. I want to be in South America. Um, I will tell you right up front, we're going to go into a lot of those markets, but we're going to do it again in partnership with our customers. Uh -huh. So if we want to go plant our flag in um, the Netherlands, for yeah. example, uh, we're going to go with a revenue stream, with a, a built business, and and really try to go um, in a, in a in a cautious, sure. risk-free environment. Yeah. I don't think you're going to see us going out there and planting six flags around the world sure. and building and hope they'll come. Yep. But with our relationships, I could very well see us saying, "Okay, Hyperscaler X wants to go to Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. We've serviced them well in the United States. Let's go to Frankfurt together." Yep. And that's really how we're going to view our international expansion. The one in the Netherlands, it ended up being uh, two buildings. Okay. One of them has uh, a revenue stream that we're very excited yeah. about, uh, in-place revenue. And the other one is a cost basis that allows us to be very competitive at a scale of 20 megawatts cool. in the port of Emschaben, which is where the cable landing station comes in okay. and allows us to have that kind of connectivity that, that uh, is inherent to that region. Sure. So when you think about hyperscale growth and and what you're focused on how do you feel like that will impact the market over the next three to five years and where do you see the market really headed from that uh, yeah. side of things um, I think it's going to be uh, continue to be lumpy yep sure I think there's going to be uh, periods of consumption yes and then there's going to be periods of digestion yep um, I think that the uh, four five big scale guys yep. are going to continue to refine their how much do they build on their own mm -hmm. and how much do they lease. Mm -hmm. um, but even that, the lease component is still going to grow pretty consistently yep. and significantly over the next four, five, six quarters. Yep. Yeah. And, and I, that's a great, great point. It's something that I spend time trying to educate the market on is just how much demand we've seen over the last you know several years and even when we weren't seeing that demand the market was still pretty healthy you know yeah. even before hyperscale started doing what it did so you know when we have a, a time period where there's less i just try to always remind people of you know the past eight quarters 12 quarters and how it's just kind of been up and down and that i don't think that's indicative on things slowing down as much as it is on just the way sometimes users want to buy. Yeah. And that's at least what I've seen. No, I think I think that's right. And and what I another trend that I would suggest is customers who would in the past be worried about inventory in an availability zone sure. or a region, they're gonna go gobble up thirty yes. megawatts. Yes. I still have not seen a customer who can deploy thirty megawatts at a time. Sure. Even when they contract for thirty megawatts, yeah. they're growing There's into a it period. a megawatt yeah. or two and they're and so what is the inefficiency yeah. in the model 
that suggest that 30 megawatts is the right build. Yes. Should we be doing more powered shells? Yep. Should we do powered shell and allow MEP to be a component to mm -hmm. build the MEP, which is really a heavy burden on the cost structure? Sure. Is that how we should build in? What, what is the change in the buying habits of those hyperscalers yeah. that pushes and puts pressure on the, the capital markets and, yeah. and ultimately the structure of a deal? All those things will evolve over yeah. time. Uh, yeah. Okay, so one last question. Sure. This is kind of a switch, but from a leadership standpoint, uh, you've been in this business for you know a long time, um, and but but talk about just you know you're, you're leading this team. Talk about some of just the things from a leadership perspective that have been important to you over your career. I mean, yeah. who's had an impact on you? What uh, general philosophies do you try and follow that have really helped shape? Uh, you know, not just what you're doing as, you know, Chief Hyperscale Officer at QTS, but just you as a person. What has, what has really um, helped shape that for you? Yeah. It's a great question. I wasn't expecting it. I know. Uh, but it's sure. a fantastic question. I don't know if you know, but I, I graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point. Okay. Um, I would say uh, the premier leadership institute in the world as we create leaders sure. of character. Yeah. Um, when I was 18 and thinking about going to West Point, I went and the recruiter said to me, and 18, what do you really know at 18? Like, do you even know what you're gonna do on Friday night? Like, you don't know much. Yeah. And I was really worried about, you know, giving my life to the, to the military. Sure. Like, that's a big, heavy burden. Yeah. And so I said, I'm not sure, and this is what he said to me. He said, listen, our job here at West Point is to build leaders of character for the nation. Hmm. Like, that's our motto. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. Notice I didn't say leaders of character for the Army. Hmm. or leaders of character for the military, mm -hmm. or even leaders of character for the United States. Leaders of character for the nation is a, a term that I have kept with me that you can be a good leader of character as a salesperson, sure. as a technician, yeah. as an electrician, yeah. as an HV, as a doctor, whatever you wanna do, be a good leader of character. And that was the first step to say, wait a second, this is something that I'm interested in. So then lastly, I will say, but what's a leader? Mm -hmm. And what's the difference between a leader and a manager? Mm -hmm. Last thing I'll share with you in that regard. Leaders lead people and managers manage things. Mm -hmm. You can manage your inbox, you can manage your project, you can manage your schedule, but leaders lead people. And yeah. that's really what gets me excited yeah. about being in this role is that sure. I don't have to manage my team. Yeah. I have to lead the team sure. and get them to do things that they wouldn't do on their own. And that's why I get excited about being in a leadership role and having the opportunity to, to put my fingerprints maybe a little bit on the data center Sure. Industry. Well, you're certainly yeah. doing that. Thank you so much for taking the time yeah. to sit down. David, this was absolutely. awesome and look hey. forward to the next discussion. Thanks very much.